Hello and welcome to tonight's Jen and Margie show. I'm Margie. And I'm Jim, sitting in for Jen tonight. So let's just call it Jim and Margie, okay? Okay. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. Tonight, as we do every week, we're talking community issues, local and beyond. We have our town clerk, Connor Deaker, joining, jo Connor Deegan, to, uh, joining us later to talk about the Trump effect, how his national efforts are and are not, filtering down to the town level. The first segment is going to be discussing bullying, what's happening, and what is, can, and should be done about it. Joining us for that is someone who is not a bully. Rather, she's a former <laughs> bullying prosecutor who saw the impact of stereotypes on her own kids, Dana Babin. Dana, welcome to our show tonight. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> All right, that didn't last very long. All right, so let's just jump right into it. Um, what type of bullying have you seen and have you experienced, had experience with? <laughs> well, as a prosecutor or as a person? Uh, I would say as a prosecutor. Okay, so first, as that. a prosecutor, I saw a wide range of bullying, but the, the type of bullying I focused on the most was bullying involving sexting. Mm -hmm. um, or sextortion, what we call sextortion. And the reason for that, Jim, is because I was working as what is called an Internet Crimes Against Children prosecutor mm -hmm. uh, for Massachusetts. And so the vast majority of my cases revolved around the use of the Internet or social media um, to conduct some sort of behavior that involved sexual, se sexual pictures. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't... You know, your audience may not be prepared to hear some of the things that right, I describe right. that I focused on, but in and around the prosecution of what is known as child pornography cases, yep. we also had a lot of cases that involved local kids that were sexting, mm -hmm. um, distributing what is child pornography, mm -hmm. and using it to hurt others, um, to uh, cause some sort of emotional impact that was not... Yeah. You know, positive. So, okay. and putting it lightly, but and that's the bullying piece because it's one thing for a child to have a have a bad judgment in allowing that picture to be taken, and some I know were taken without the child's knowledge. Um, but then it's another thing for someone to use that against them to manipulate or or put down or you know bully. Um, that's yes. where it's. It, it's a double wrong. Right. And in the criminal context, there really wasn't a bullying charge. It was yeah. another type of charge that we would bring, for example, criminal harassment or dist distribution of child pornography, mm -hmm. um, whatever the case may be, mm. for those types of situations. That said, we did not, we as prosecutors, I as a prosecutor, did not like pursuing cases against children mm -hmm. for the distribution of child pornography. That's a very egregious offense punishable by a minimum of 10 years in the state prison. Wow. So, yes, so uh, we looked for alternatives, education, and um, other charges we might be able to bring in the event that we really did need to bring charges, um, right. which was extremely rare right. when children were involved. I can't even remember bringing yeah. a charge against a child like that. Now, you know, um, I did like a little bit of research on um, numbers, which I thought were interesting. Uh, I was looking at the American Society for the Positive Care of Children, and they st their statistics are 28% of children experience bullying, oh. and 70% of kids have seen it or observed it. And I looked at Hopkinton's mm -hmm. numbers. Um, Superintendent Kathy McLeod had some information on that. And the latest ones in 2016, the middle school, 27% of kids experienced being bullied. And the high school had 22% experienced being bullied. So, you know, if somebody in the audience out there is interested in sharing their story about what they've observed about bullying uh, in, in the school system, we'd be interested in hearing that and kind of how, uh, how it was addressed. Or maybe you have questions for Dana, uh, who could give her some of her thoughts on how to, how to deal with a child who's making a bad decision or, or has a bad judgment. Mm -hmm. I know today uh, at camp, I work at camp, there was a group of boys on the playground, and often it, bullying happens on those downtimes playground where there isn't the same adult supervision yeah. and guidance. Um, 
and I noticed one kid removed himself from this group and looked sad. So I said, what's happening? And he said, oh, you know, they, they said that I was whatever. One said something to him, oh, you're sitting so quietly like a little bird. And so the first kid said, well, I didn't think that was a bad thing. You know, mm -hmm. and I said, well, maybe that's a mistake in judgment. And he didn't realize. But then the next thing that happened was um, the kid who had moved himself apart was now crying. Mm -hmm. So I said, what happened now? And the kids around the kid who had done the, um, had made the mistake said, oh, he all asked us to raise our hand if we liked the kid who's now feeling mm -hmm. isolated. And, you know, so that's clearly bullying, you mm -hmm. know, although I know bullying is a continued targeted thing. Well, there is a statutory definition in Massachusetts, yeah. but, um, and I'd be happy to read it, but, you know, bullying comes in a lot of different forms. And I think a lot of people struggle with it because the definition of it, that is, because there's teasing and when does teasing become bullying? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. and it, it does have to reach a certain point before it becomes bullying under the law. But in a common, you know, environment like this one in schools, it, it just, we kind of throw the term around bullying this, bullying right. that. So I understand when people say, oh, well, was it really bullying? Well. It may not have been bullying under the definition of the law, but it's not exactly good. So. <laughs> right, 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 right. Exactly. We still want as and, adults to And what shape. I'm interested in, you know, I was looking at the uh, school departments. They have a plan. It's called the Bullying Prevention and Intervention yes, Plan. Yes. It's 33 pages long. And I and had to read at that. At least 32, no, 33 pages long. And at least 32 of those pages is about this is what bullying is and this is what you have to do in response to it. Yes. And honestly, I'm really much more interested in what is is going on about trying to change the culture mm -hmm. so that bullying doesn't become the cool thing to do. And whenever I talk to my 16-year-old about this, she rolls her eyes at me. And that's what's <laughs> interesting is that don't you feel like as adults who grew up in a different age, it has become somewhat of a cool thing to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think that that is what's, um, I, you know, the impact of social media obviously has shaped yeah. this. Yeah. So that is why we are faced with this, I think. And do you think that you're totally right. And do you think that adults are able to kind of crack that nut and get I, in there? Or are the kids just going to say, you know, these are grown-ups and they don't know? Well, then you get into my internet safety presentations. And what I might recommend with that mm -hmm. is, first of all, I think start young. And okay. this goes not just to the schools, because the schools have a lot to handle. And I've seen the plans, and I know they were mandated as of 2010 to create those plans. And it's it's hard to implement and it's hard to keep tabs on every kid. Um, yeah. Uh, but as adults, parents, guardians, uncles, aunts, neighbors, whatever, um, to get engaged with the kids at a very young age and mm -hmm. to stay involved in their social media behavior. Mm -hmm. So I, I am not your child's parent, so I'm not going to tell you how to parent your kid. I will just right. give you my opinion on what I think is good for my kids, yeah. and that is staying involved early and often. and even if it means, so some people will say, well, once they reach a teenage years, I kind of feel bad in invading their privacy. And I'll go to that kid's Instagram account and go, that kid has 2,100 friends wow. on Instagram. Okay. Right. So you don't want to go and invade his or her privacy. Mm -hmm. What do you think <laughs> he or she is doing with the 2,100 right. people that have now seen exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. So there is, they have this sense of privacy. There is no privacy on the internet. Right. From yeah. your parents, from your friends. There is none or on social media. So yeah. forget it. I mean, yeah. even if you use the privacy settings. You yeah. have 2,100 friends who are seeing that every time you Which post it. Right. I mean, even, even if you have one, right. you lose privacy. I mean, right. Then I get in and put on my legal hat. You have okay. no privacy. Now, so I, I, want, I want to get to you in a minute because yeah. you have a, a unique insight because of the work that you do right. down at Elmwood School. Right. And um, so I'm like, you know, Daniel was talking about starting young. So I'm interested in that. But we did get an email asking, good. at what point do you involve the police with student bullying? Yeah. So that's a very good question. question. And Thank I you. will put on my former Thank prosecutor you, hat. Her. And I still work with police a lot. I still consult to what's called the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Forces. But uh, thank you for the question. Great uh, question. And I believe you should get the police involved as soon as possible. I think wow. we often err on the side of misjudgment, in my opinion, in not involving them sooner mm -hmm. because they're a great resource. Yeah. Um, and 
it oftentimes can give an additional resources to the school that, like I said, the school is overwhelmed. Yeah. And I think sometimes, unfortunately, the school looks at the police and as you know, they might butt heads a little bit on some issues. And mm. so they don't always want to run to the police right away. I, I'm not saying this town, just mm-hmm. as a prosecutor, I saw it with a lot of towns. Mm-hmm. We tried to encourage, we as prosecutors, the local schools to involve police as soon as possible. Okay. If you're wondering but, to yourself, yeah. should we call the police? Okay. You should probably so call So there's the, the answer right there. Yes. If you think this looks like bullying, then go ahead. And you know, that's like, from what the school. If, what if somebody is overreacting what if but why not listen, let them decide the because the, dis- have the police that, right? have discretion and i will tell okay. you we use our discretion in law enforcement i think pretty well mm-hmm. um you know i mean there's officer phil everyone yes. else. he's a great i mean yes. we really they are there to befriend you yes. and to help you and before it gets out of control why mm-hmm. not have someone come in before it gets to any egregious stages and in, right. in addition parents um, sometimes we'll ask, well, what, what do I do if I feel like my kid is being bullied or my kid is the bully? Because, hey, it oh. happens. There's a lot. Bullies aren't always bad people. They're good people that make bad decisions. We've all right. made bad decisions in our lives. So we're right. teaching them, too, better behavior. But what do I do? Should I um, call the parent of the other child involved? Mm-hmm. Again, my personal opinion, I wouldn't do that. I mean, mm-hmm. you just don't know where it's going to go from there. I would involve authorities at the school, at the police department. Um, some sort of professional instead of taking it to the other person. I, it's a personal choice, yes, but I think that sometimes it can go very awry and yeah. it can muddy the waters a little bit and make okay. it harder to resolve. So I got another email, and actually, Margie, I'd be interested because Dana was talking about how start young, start early, and get in there. And this email is, what is the line between classmate teasing and bullying? So maybe you could like talk a little bit about your experiences well, at the younger grades. we had to, as uh, at Elmwood School, we had to read through, and actually I was on the group of people that per, that um, helped put that together, the yep. bullying paper thing. Yep. Um, and what happens, the definition of bullying that I understand is it has to be targeted, repetitive. Mm-hmm. You know, so it has to be the same, and it has to be an imbalance of power. Okay. So in the case of um, the kid on the playground, the, the boy who was crying yeah. said he's done this before. Okay. So, and I've seen this, the perpetrator, the perp, yeah. I've seen him do this in other cases. He himself, you know, just trying to figure it out, a little bit of low self esteem, mm-hmm. but also really bad uh, filter. Mm-hmm. So he'll just say something and then he says, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't yeah. mean to say that. But he's not really thinking before he says something. Anyway, back to what you were saying. Um, in the classrooms at Elmwood School, we actually have a program built into the second grade curriculum, third grade curriculum, that's talking about upstanding, mm-hmm. upstanders. So you don't just sit there right. and watch the kid get teased and do nothing, mm-hmm. you know, or even worse. I mean, God forbid, I heard this horrible thing where there were some kids taking a video of a 31-year-old man drowning. I know. And I and they videoed and they laughed and they made fun of it. And some of this I think is because of reality TV and the and the horrible you know the, some of the horrible things on TV that every the soundtrack is laughing when this horrible thing is happening. I don't know, that's just inhumane. It is inhumane. So I think some of it's the culture, but I don't think it's Yeah. I I am an optimist. Yeah. So I don't want to say that I think it's this is everyone yeah I do think there are some people that have had bad programming yeah you know and and then they're the ones who it doesn't seem like a horrible thing to laugh at a person who falls yeah to laugh at a person who's clearly you know I mean honestly some examples since we're going to tra- talk about Trump later yeah the fact that Trump could make fun of a, a, a person who reporter. had trouble speaking yeah in publicly as our president was appalling to me so um, I think our role models need to be very careful mm-hmm. about what we are role modeling for our children okay. and so in the second and third grade classroom this is taught as part of wellness mm-hmm. and they talk about bullying and they talk about you know language to use and and how to stand up for yourself I'm not comfortable when you blah 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 mm-hmm. and I want you to stop the, that is all very true <laughs> The problem is a lot of victims of bullying don't know they're victims. Right. Oh. So I think it starts small. 
and mm. they a lot of victims of a lot of crimes don't want to be the victim. They right. don't like to associate themselves with that, and I completely understand that. Yeah, sure. Um, so sometimes the behavior that's occurring through social media, or you know, can start with a, a little bit of joking yes. humor, and it's I think it's our responsibility as adults to teach them what's appropriate humor and what's not appropriate humor. You shouldn't be laughing at that, right. you know. Exactly. Um, because they okay. see it everywhere. We have a few minutes left. Can and you repeat so the question again? To get did, to. did I answer the question? I think yes. You did. Okay, yes. good. Okay. Uh, and there's another email. Somebody was asking Is excluding a student from group from a group bullying, and is there a way to quietly get bullied, which is what you were just talking about? Yes, so to the former, yes. Exclusion is one of the examples of the ways you can be bullied. I have a list of them. So okay. can Do you mind reading the list? Uh, yes. I can go back and read that list that I wrote. Um, so there's verbal bullying, using words, written, oral, whatever way, social media, etc. cetera. Uh, social exclusion mm -hmm. slash inclusion, or uh, social exclusion, not being included. Um, you know, just feeling isolated. There's obviously physical brutality. Yeah. Um, there's lies, rumor, and innuendo, what mm. we know is gossip, but it just mm. gets egregious when you have, again, social media mm -hmm. at right. your disposal. Mm -hmm. Theft, things get, you know, you, the, the old lunch money being stolen, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, hurting someone's property, their notebooks, their lockers, etc., their cars. Being threatened or forced to do certain things, um, physically forced or threatened into doing something. We get that a lot with the sextortion cases that I saw. Mm. Um, sexual and gender-based bullying is pretty common these days. Racially-based bullying is still common. And then, of course, cyberbullying, the one that I saw the most. So it okay. was sexting, sextortion. So like you that. actually said something that was very, very interesting when you talk about the power differential. Yeah. And my wife happens to be a pediatrician, and she was oh. also on one of these committees at a school yeah. coming up with guidelines and stuff. And one of the things that she always says is oftentimes – People will say, just get the bully and the victim together, get them in a room, and get them to talk it out. But the power differential there, yeah. just it doesn't work. And so... Um, I totally agree. Yeah, one it of the huge things work. through this whole Hawkington document was um, respect. Right. You know, and I really think that, like, it's hard. You gotta, you gotta like, get the kids to understand and, and log into respect mm -hmm. and have it not be like, oh, the parents are like, you know... Accepting one another for who we are right. and respecting one another. Right. Sounds good. So Unique individual. Before we do. go, I did want to make sure I ask you. So, are you a prosecutor anymore? Do you get something else that you're doing now? <laughs> She's a mom. So, I'm, I'm first and foremost a wife and mother, uh, and I still do consult, like I said, in the legal realm in this area. But I mostly spend my time creating this clothing line. And oh. the mission of the clothing line is to encourage people to be themselves, to be true to themselves, and um, for all the rest of us to support them in their endeavors to be authentic. So, nice. why did we, you come up with that? I love that. Uh, well, one, I had the background that I have, okay. and then I had twin girls, and I ended up quitting prosecuting and going into consulting. Uh -huh. uh, and I saw my twin girls develop a very unique interest that wasn't exactly the norm. Mm -hmm. And at a very young age, we're talking Jim and Margie, but um, <laughs> I saw even at such a young age, the comments fly around the room and usually it was from adults. Oh. <laughs> so, and I saw my little girls be impacted by the comments. And mm -hmm. I think it just made me, it sent a message to me maybe think before speaking because I know they're young and they may not have all their words yet, but they're taking in so much, those little sponges Absolutely. and yes. learning from us. Yeah. And so it starts young and then they get to a certain age and they're using iPads and they're playing games and they see all kinds of joking behavior on there, people making fun of each other. And then they get to social media where people are leaving comments. And one thing I always say is see, see what your kids are doing on social media. Ask them to show you if you're not looking at it regularly. I, you know, if you can take their phones away at night so they don't go to their bed with, room with them and check their phones, that's great. If you don't want to do that, at least ask them to show you and do the best you can. Um, yeah. That's all we ask. And take a look at what comments are being said and are they responding? If there's a degrading comment, teach them. Just don't even acknowledge it. Right. So how does, so, how does, so I mean, obviously your, your line is, um, I almost said think pink, but that's, <laughs> that's something different. Yeah. Um, think pink truck. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So like, 
how, how do you get that across? And we only have two minutes left, so. Well, it is hard, but it's, it's um, I get a chance to talk with people like this okay. is the best way um, mm -hmm. because it's hard to convey it in the three second attention span that people have these days on social media. <laughs> right. I'm basically, you know, a very small shop but I'm slowly but surely growing. I just started to go wholesale. I'm in some pretty neat stores, you know, for the mm -hmm. wholesale. That's, so it's very exciting. I have 14 designs now. And I think the greatest thing is I'm seeing a very good uptick in the number of adult men that are wearing it. Oh, oh I fantastic. love Fantastic. I always it's, say it takes a real man to wear it. pink. You would look good in pink. <laughs> yeah, the Do whole message is be different and don't be afraid to be different. It's right. all good. And we're sending a great message to kids by doing that. Right. Yeah. Well, you've got, a lot of, you've got a lot of knowledge and I really hope that, that we have you back. Uh, so several more times to delve into this topic because I just think it's really important in the world. And the website is pinktruckdesigns.com. Pinktruckdesigns.com. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we'll be back after a short break to talk about the Trump effect with Connor Deegan. Yeah. So we hope you stay tuned. Thank you. I'd like to invite you to join us for this week's episode of Character Matters where we talk about the character trait of being honest. Why do people tell the truth? We're going to have historical people. George Washington is going to show up. We're going to talk to people in our town who are honest and wonderful businessmen. And we're going to have some puppets talking about what they saw when people were honest. Please join us. You never know who will show up. What? Have you ever considered texting and driving? If so, you should know the consequences. If caught texting and driving for the first time, you could get an $100 fine plus your license taken away for 60 days. The consequences only get worse the more you get caught. Even if you don't get caught, there could be serious effects. You could get into a car accident and hurt yourself or someone else. Texting and driving is a very dangerous combination, so stop before this happens to you. This week on HKM Television, Welcome back to the Jim and Margie show. She's Margie Wigan. And he's Jim Cousins sitting in for Jen. Our next topic is all about Trump. How is he or he not affecting the operations of local town government? And do you think it's a positive or a negative? Give us a call or an email. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And now welcome Connor Deegan. Hey, welcome to the show. Hi, Jim and Margie. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for getting it right, Jim and Margie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I tried to get Mike to change the uh, logo, but he wouldn't do it today. We could have put a sticker up no. there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I would like to dive right into this because I'm very interested in this. You know, we're in a blue state and you hear a lot of negative stuff about Trump. You don't hear a lot of positive stuff, but I would really like to know, starting off, um, what effect have you seen in your day-to-day -day job or in local town government by if President any. Trump? So I would say that really there's very low impact on the local level. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Massachusetts, we do a lot on our own in the municipalities, and we Yay. really carry ourselves quite a bit. Uh, I'd say there's still a big impact on how uh, voting reform is occurring. You know, we're seeing a lot of changes in how people vote and how we continue in our, our system for voting since all the allegations of potential fraud during the election mm -hmm. process. Yeah, didn't he want access to everybody's voter records? Still does. I mean, and then there were some states who absolutely shut him down. And Right. Now, is that something that, like, you deal with, or is that something that the state responds to that request? So Massachusetts is actually an interesting one for that because... The Massachusetts was chalked up as one of the ones that outright refused to cooperate, right. mm -hmm. but that's because the records that were being requested aren't kept by the state. It's kept by oh. the municipalities. Okay. All the localities keep their own voting records. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, now that's there's good. been like a huge outcry, you know, over that. Oh, he's asking for all this stuff. But one thing I noticed was, didn't the original letter say? publicly available records so it's not as if they're asking for something that's private right yes that's correct uh, they're not asking for anything that is not already public mm -hmm. and if they decide to go around to 
all of the towns and cities in Massachusetts, then there's some information they'll be able to get. I think the biggest concern people have is the fear that they'll know how the they voted Mm -hmm. that's the biggest fear people have okay yeah and i and i i think part of that is because there does seem to be a um a vindictive quality and a you know if you don't do this for me saying that i might so if there's a huge file or dossier or comp compilation of everyone's records Mm -hmm. i even wonder if there's going to be somehow access to Facebook, whether you like or you don't like certain posts. Mm -hmm. um, Well, that's up to you, right? mm -hmm. Whether you set your public settings. I don't know. I I tried to post uh, something about SETI Warren several times and Facebook wouldn't let me post it. No kidding. Okay. The one thing that made me um, uh, like wonder is the letter asked for the last four digits of your social security number. Do you even have that? So we do take that sometimes but it's not public record. Oh, okay. Um, when you sign up, when you register to vote, uh, you have one of two options for identification that you put down on the registration form. Uh-huh. And it's either your mass ID number or last four of your social security. So your driver's license. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so those are the only, Im- that's the only information we gather and we just cross check it in our system to make sure that you're actually, you know, a citizen or actually a person who's registered in the system for the RMV. But it's not information that when people ask for uh, the voter rolls that we mm. provide. Yeah. Uh, it's redacted information because it's private info. Right. So you know the book 1984, right? Oh, yeah. So isn't there like Big Brother is watching you? Is that that? Yeah. So the more information government has mm-hmm. and then artificial intelligence and, and, uh, facial recognition software yeah. and there just seem to be so many ways right. of of watching and overseeing people's choices and people's actions but you know what though the biggest problem with that is that we do it to ourselves because it's all free and what oh, do they yeah. always say on the internet right mm-hmm. if yeah. you're not paying then you are the product and you give up that information in exchange for having google give you an awesome email yeah, service yeah. and Facebook connecting you to all your friends and I know. you know what I mean you're so right. like we give up a lot of that stuff by ourselves so what do you guys think if you're watching us and you have a thought about this or you want to join the conversation do you feel like there are you comfortable with the government having all of our voting uh, registration information or do you feel like there's a little bit too much information out there through social media or um, anything Mm. so give us a call the information is on the screen or email us yeah and i'll say right away the first thing that some people i've explained to a number of people already they have nothing to worry about when it comes to how they voted because one of the benefits of our system in massachusetts is with all paper ballots that you just blindly cast your vote and no one ever gets to know after it's crossed that threshold i see so mm-hmm. there's no way to connect that ballot to you. Well, of course, why wouldn't it be scary? Didn't the letter say they wanted information going back 10 years? Yes. So, I mean, of course, like, and the other thing too is I was, you know, reading how there are thousands of people in certain states that are going and unenrolling, thinking that this, number one, is how can I protect their information if it's 10 years old? Yeah. And I mean, have you seen any of that around here? So I have seen um, in the past, couple of months even uh, a lot of party changes okay uh, whether it be to unenrolled mm. or to become a Democrat or Republican uh, I've I mean I think it's been a consistent trend that yeah. people have been kind of leaving political parties and mm. especially in states like Massachusetts where we have open primaries there's a lot of positives of being unenrolled mm-hmm. Uh, which is what? Which is not having a party. So and you can pick whichever one you wanted to vote. Yeah, in. when you go into a primary, if you have a party that's a recognized party with its own ballot, that's the only ballot you get. Yeah. When you're unenrolled, you get to decide when you walk in how which ballot do I feel like taking today. Yeah. Okay. But isn't that noted somewhere that you pulled so say if you pull a democratic ballot, isn't that noted that you're now sort of in a democratic camp Isn't so that not necessarily because what is recorded is what primary you chose to vote in but 
if you look at some people's voter history, which that's all public to see which they, what they voted in and what primary they chose, then you'll see that some people will switch oh, back and forth yeah. and they, they'll choose based on which, the person. which race has more of an impact to them. Right. Uh, and who they feel is a better candidate to move up. Right. And so I, I, I don't really count. I've seen plenty of people who are uh, unenrolled that I view as pretty conservative that tend to still get Democratic ballots on occasion. Mm-hmm. And that's just because, you know, sometimes their preference is picking a better candidate out of the ones that are there versus not having, like, they feel like there's a stake in the other race. Right, right. right. I got an email question here, uh, which is kind of related. Does the town sell any town information Ooh. to marketers or anybody else? No, we do not sell any information to marketers, anything like that. Uh, technically, any of our records that I have in my office is public and free to access. Uh, if someone for marketing reasons decided to come to me for some kind of information on residents, uh, they could, the most they can get really is if they're a voter, Mm -hmm. Uh, the ones that can go out to folks can only be those who are over the age of 17 and it doesn't include public safety officers. So there's a lot of things that get redacted from what the public can access. Uh, they don't get phone numbers. They don't get emails. All they really can get are what's the address. So, um, I, I, that's, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, I, it was my impression that the Republican town committee could check something <laughs> to know how people voted in the past, to know okay. who they could encourage. Oh, you know what? I heard somebody talking about that. And the Democratic committee, same thing. I yeah. think they can check how people voted in order to say, hey, we'd like to bring you on our committee. And so I don't know how they could check that. If I go to you and say, I'm just wondering how Margie voted you know, in the last several years, I could find out which ballot she pulled? So yeah, you could find out what ballot Margie had pulled for the past few years. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you did so, the thing that they actually have, both parties have it, uh, where they collect all this data over the course of years. Yeah. And then they use that to try to see, okay, how often do these people go to elections? How often? And it's it's data points that they gather up Mm -hmm. and then use to try and find out where their best shots at, at getting victories and getting votes are. So right. is this where it is, you know, you hear a lot about these machines, these political machines, yes. and they are actually going beyond zip codes, and they're going by neighborhoods and by streets saying these are the people we should target. Is is your data where that's coming from? Uh, some of it is that. Mm-hmm. It's years of compiled data and seeing, as I said, if they see that there's a group of people that votes in every election, and then they can look and say, well, look, they also, every time they go to a primary, they always vote Republican, yeah. even if they're unenrolled. They might say, okay, well, let's try to see if we can uh, contact them and see if we can convince them to vote a certain way. And you said or earlier. Or if, if you want them to vote Republican, then you go and you encourage them to get to the polls. Yeah. So I, that's my understanding is there is information and a some kind of data printout thing right. that they could identify who they can encourage to vote who they could try to coerce to yep. or talk with. Right. Both well, parties said, actually have their own databases. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I've actually been on both sides of it. Yeah. Because okay. I used to work in politics as well. And when uh-huh. I was on that edge, Perfect. I saw the parts where, you know, I had access to the same database that had, uh, like, with what things people voted in. Right. Uh, and, wait, are, are you part of the swamp? No. Okay. So the, we don't have a swamp here. I know. We I have know. a reservoir. We have some lakes. <laughs> so, but would they have to do what you were saying earlier? Would they have to go to every single town in Massachusetts individually and appear and say, "Give us this stuff," or is there somehow you can access it online? So the only way they can get it online is still by talking to us okay. individually. But they can, the way the records laws are written, they can send us an email requesting it and requesting it in digital format, like an Excel file. Okay. And then if they do that, then they can get those records. And as I said, they take years and years of them and try to compile those to get mm. their data. Right. Is that like a ton of work? It, it can take some time. Yeah. Uh, it, fortunately, for the most part, it's set up into... 
extracting data out of our resident and voter system. Yeah. And it takes a while for that data to compile all on its own, and then it's just transferring it over from certain types of file formats into right. Excel. Right. So the state went pretty pretty strongly for Hillary in the last mm -hmm. election. I think it was like 60%. But that yeah, depends just who under. you ask. Just under. Hmm? I think that depends who you ask because I was hearing, I thought I heard Trump say something about Massachusetts. There was No, Eric Sonnet was saying mm -hmm. that Massachusetts was 16% Something. If you listen to what he said, math. he said at the beginning. Oh, okay, okay. So, by the, okay. so you know how you know, things changed for Hillary that night? Yeah. <laughs> I think things okay. changed Thank by the, you. Yeah, all the ballots came you. in. It was okay. about 60 for Hillary, like you said. Okay. Yeah. And then as it went for uh, Trump, I believe it was 32, just to almost 33. Yeah. And then everything else combined was just under 7.5%. So... You know, there, it clearly was very small, whatever votes were taken away from either one of them. Right, right. Uh, but it was still a very clear Democratic victory, which wasn't surprising for a state like Massachusetts. Right. right. What do you think about the, um, all the allegations of voter fraud? I know, you know, like, we've heard a lot from New Hampshire and all that kind of stuff. What's your, what's your thing I think that? especially in Massachusetts, it's extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I said the same thing throughout the process to anyone who asked. It's uh, you have to go through a whole bunch of hurdles to do it. Yeah. Uh, we're able to have our paper trail to prevent, you know, electronic hacking or anything like that of yeah. voter information, mm -hmm. and it's just extremely difficult to go through. And you have to really think it out, run the risk that you might actually be recognized by our, our election workers too. Yeah. Uh, and, and we've yeah. had folks try to to do things at the polls and you've actually seen that so to come and say that there's someone else's there's someone else and take up pull a different ballot to or try to vote for someone else or vote twice or yeah and they've always been turned away good wow go election yeah. workers we love our election workers we have we have Thank some you. of the best election workers yes yes they are amazing Wonderful. i'm lucky to have them yes yeah. you are um but, like, you know, there's a lot of talk about how a lot of them are people have died and they're not off the rolls or they have moved and they haven't, you know, they haven't, I don't know, deregistered when they registered somewhere else. Is oh. that, like, does that rise to the level of you notice that? So for a lot of it, yes. Uh, when it comes to people passing away, mm -hmm. well, for one, we're also the office that processes death certificates <laughs> so, okay. Okay. so the yeah. moment that someone's death certificate comes into my queue to be processed yeah we then go in and delete them from the voter rolls okay um, Yay. during early I'm voting sorry, it was me like going down and going down to the early voting place and scratching out names saying that you know they're deceased don't let them and in vote. Yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. Uh, wow. And now, somebody listening um, thank you. was um, appreciative of your comment that you love your election workers because they've asked, how does one become an election uh -huh. worker? That is a good question. <laughs> uh, so you can either get the application right online on the town's website if you go to the town clerk's page, or you can stop by my office, and I'd love to give you an election worker application. We'll be having most likely training before our next uh before our next actual election which our next scheduled one isn't until the may town election in 2018 but you know we need a lot of new election workers uh it's always great to have new faces and have people who we can rely on to help us you know really be the gatekeepers of democracy mm -hmm. yeah and I, every time i go in it doesn't seem like a difficult job but you obviously need to be honest and you need to be able to read uh, because they ask, what's your street? What's your name? What's your street number? That's pretty much it, give you the ballot. So I don't think it's a complicated thing, but I think it has to be a person who really pays attention, like you were it saying. Does. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of awareness involved. Right. Uh, I have all of my election workers be like observe everything that they see, and then they report it to you know, the supervisor essentially for each precinct so that all of the information can be logged and I keep record books for every precinct of what goes on. You're great at this job. 
Can I just say thank you so much for being our town clerk? Well, thank you. Very <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is getting kind of far afield, but apparently yeah. somebody else is. Somebody's asking if has anyone has any couple walked in yet and asked you to marry them? Uh, yes, I've, I've actually All the time. I, I have married quite a few couples. Is that right? My yes. daughter. Oh. No, no, not no, married. I didn't, no, no, you I just did, did a I did certificate. the certificate. Yeah, the certificate yeah, yeah, yeah. for her. But oh. I've actually married quite a few just couples. Just walking in off point. the street. That's so cute. Uh, some, but it's most of them uh, come in and they get their intention done, and then they find out that I can just perform it for them. And they'll, uh, when their waiting periods up, they'll just swing by and do it right there. Okay, it happened more in town hall than so, anywhere else. So, so before, which is a little bit too late, before we go totally off the rails, I'd like to bring it back to Trump. Okay, yeah. so you work in town hall. Yes. Um, is he uh, a presence there? Like the people. At local government, talk in terms about you know the effect for good or for bad that he may have on your jobs there and what's happening in town. Federal regulation changes are definitely things that all the town employees keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that in a state like Massachusetts, a lot of the state regulations are more strict than the federal ones are anyway. Okay. <laughs> so we end up running into the. The, we're very we're not very affected because uh -huh. of the fact that state regulations are still very strong and the state authorities usually it's uh, the federal just set the the standard uh -huh. and Massachusetts likes to go above the standard on a lot of the things that the Trump administration is scaled back. But I on. wonder like could the Trump administration do what we've seen in some other states where the state government is passing a law that invalidates local laws could the federal government pass a law that you couldn't go beyond what their their um restrictions are yes it's quite possible mm. uh we haven't seen anything as of yet mm -hmm. but it's entirely possible the states are you know many parts of one whole yeah uh that's yeah. a good way of so it. it it's very possible that the federal government can make demands of the states mm -hmm. and if the states are constitutionally able to uh, fulfill that then they may have to right and wouldn't health care be one of the things that would be affecting town employees if the health care changes would Massachusetts have its own health care thing or would it have to buy into whatever the Better Care Reconciliation Act so we actually under Governor Romney, we actually yes. had a uh, mass health form, yes. which is actually kind of what Obamacare was made after. Right. Yeah. And so we're one of the states that we kind of were the trailblazers on it. We were not ones that are going to be affected as much by uh, by the federal government changing their what kind of subsidies they give. Well. Unless they roll back the Medicare expansion. That's I true. assume I don't actually know. I assume Massachusetts took them up on the Medicare expansion. Most likely. I would assume they did. Yeah. So if that was rolled back, that would have an effect. Yes. And that would be a negative effect. Yes. For especially sure. for folks who actually do need it. Yes. You know, and that's like, I mean, I just think it's because we're in a blue state, but all we hear is that. All we hear is that it's negative effects. They're going to gut this. They're not going to replace that. And, you know, I just don't know. I don't really see a lot of the other side of the story. And I don't know if it's just because of our location, you know, or... Does anyone out there want to add in to the conversation? And do you know any positive effects that could come from Massachusetts from um, the Trump administration and some of the changes he's making? Right. Give us a call. Hey, better hurry. We only have two minutes left on this segment. <laughs> yes, hurry. So, um, obviously, you have a lot of the public cycling in and out in front of your window. Um, do they talk a lot about politics? Do you get a lot of, like, your earful of one way or the other? Yeah, I actually love having political discussions with okay. folks of, of any walk of life. It It's really fascinating to talk with people about their politics and you know part of it ends up being their story yeah you find yes. out a lot about someone by their politics and it kind of leads to what their background is who they are as a person uh i always find it really fascinating to get to know people like that does that attitude get into a lot of arguments uh it gets me into a couple of lively <laughs> debates but uh... and i from what i know about conrad he's more of a question you're more of a questioner right yeah. 
I'm you the devil's the... advocate in that's debates. Right. I, I okay. give yeah. the, well, yeah, that's one way of looking at it, but what about this? Right. So he's right. Mm, so he instigates the arguments rather than. <laughs> I see. Action. We'll have to have you back on for an argument sometime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, and I hope that you may decide to stick around for our segment coming up after the break. And our third segment is going to be about hidden summer gems. Where do you go in the summertime? This week on Wake Up and Smell the Poetry. My only hesitation Poets, is storytellers, and musicians perform and share um, their original works. <laughs> Hello, Huntington. <laughs> Today I have a poem for you entitled Cowboy Poetry. Jake the rancher went one day to mend a distant fence. And I play it. Here's a silly one, Tuba Christmas every year. Tuba which Christmas, is huh? exactly <clears throat> what it sounds like. It's tubas playing Christmas tunes. Um, All tubas, no other instruments? It's tubas, euphoniums, everything in the tuba family. In the family, okay. And the really short story is that it was um, first put on to honor a tuba teacher and player named William Bell, who was born on Christmas Day. This week on the Golden Pan, Masha, Lisa, and Pat give us a lesson on making potato knockies. Sopping a lot. There's a lot of everybody that sweets is on. But I would think once you've made the dough and you're making, you're in that process of making them. I would want to make like a, another one just so I can throw it in the freezer. Exactly. You could either freeze the dough or the uh, and yucky, right. whatever you want. All right, welcome back to our final segment of the evening. Quick 10 minutes on your hidden favorite spots to go in the summer. Um, do you have a favorite spot in or near Hockington to kick back and relax or to get active and work up a sweat? I hope you contact us by phone or email and share your best places and stories. So I don't really have a lot myself. Oh, and by <laughs> the way, Connor is staying with us for Yay, this segment. Connor's so thank you, Connor. Thank you for keeping me around. I Always enjoy being around for you guys. Yeah, excellent. And we would have right. we would have kept Dana too. I think we all could contribute to our favorite summer spot. Yeah. Yep. Well, the first one she I have to, to mention go. because if I don't, our director John Riss is going to run out here is the trail system. Oh yes. Um, you know, and actually, I think I just heard him talking about John. Were you talking about forest bathing? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we talked about that a little on our last. No, show. he was talking about that tonight. And how like nice it is to like walk through the forest and how relaxing and do all those studies that it's really nice for you. So I think that um, anytime you can get a trail that's well maintained, it's such a pleasure. You don't have to worry about stumbling over anything. You're just like looking around and enjoying nature, and you're not, you're not worried about getting lost or eaten by a bear. Well, we have so many like really nice trails in Hopkinton. Yeah, we're really lucky. I absolutely love going out in the trails because I just. I mean, I also like difficult trails, too. I love hiking. Yeah. So when I get a chance to go out into the woods, it's just extremely relaxing to me. Right. And uh, I actually go out there with my girlfriend quite often because she, I managed to convince her to go out because she likes to do, um, I didn't know about this until I met her, it was letterboxing. Oh, yes. And so she's like, she will find like some trail that has like hidden letterbox stamps at it. And then, so we'll go there and we'll each get a little bit of what we yeah. enjoy out of it. Yeah. All right. Well, this is a quick segment. It's a little bit, we've got less than 10 minutes now. So if you guys have a place that you love, please call us up and let us know. I do have to give a pitch for Kimball's because once Kimball's, <laughs> once they started seafood, yes. oh my yes. gosh, I love that. Seafood, mini golf. Ice cream. A little where bumper place. boats. What do yeah. they have? A little bumper boats yeah. or what? Squirty boats? Yeah. They yeah. got this new thing where you just like, you're in a harness and they take you up a pole and you slide down. No way. It's like a mini tiny Walt Disney World. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Close by. Yeah, I know. It's like 10, what is that? 15, no, about 20? A half, half, an half an hour. hour? 30, yeah. 40 minutes. Yeah. How about you? Well, I was going to say um, I love the fact that we have that Hopkinton Area Land Trust um, here, mm -hmm. which does have all the trails and maintains the trails, gives trails to Eagle Scouts yeah. to build these cool bridges and benches and wonderful things. Um, I also know there there is a lot of people love to go on Lake Whitehall yeah. because they just put a canoe in. And I have to say, the first time I went on Lake Whitehall, I had no idea how huge and beautiful and private it is. In right. Because when I lived on Lake Maspinock, you can see it from 
135, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call that Wood Street, yep. um, Main Street. You can see it, you know, it's, it is in private, Sandy Beach. So you can pretty much, you know it's there. Right. But Whitehall, there's a parking lot and some boats in the parking lot. And you say, okay, something's over there. I'm not quite sure. Yep. But when you get on it, it's amazing. There are beaver yeah. dams, yeah. all kinds of cool stuff. So I know a lot of people love that. Oh, yeah. And there are beautiful trails and forests over there, too. Yeah. Very private. Um, this week at camp, we're, I'm doing nature walks. And the walk that I do is on private land owned by Weston. Yeah. And it's um, right next to a brook, which is babbling, and there are just that I it's it is like forest bathing. Yeah. Um, and I today was just thinking how amazing how amazing it is to be able to walk in nature without mm. hearing traffic, hearing you know, or seeing anything that's n unnatural. Right. It's just trees and woods and uh, birds and rock so that is an amazing thing i also have to say i love to walk on beaches mm -hmm. i'm not so much of a beach sitter now mm. too many freckles oh, my favorite day at the beach is overcast and slightly drizzly you can still get i was gonna say <laughs> miss yeah so but i like to walk and, yep. and pick up beach rocks yeah and just look because to me there's so many amazing things in nature right just beach rock and give me some nature that's my favorite thing it could be anywhere i know i know it's just it can be so beautiful. Rockport has tide pools. We used to go there as, as children. Yeah. Rockport, Gloucester. Um, you go out on Rocky Neck, I think. Yeah. And uh, explore the little, it also kind of little things in the tide pools, periwinkles. Doesn't Hopkins have tide pools? What do they call those pools that were, when they were building Cess Hopkins? Not cesspools. <laughs> they, were, they were building Hopkins. The vernal pools. Vernal, vernal pools. pools. That's what Those it are is. in the springtime. Yes. Yeah. And that's where you hear spring peepers with the uh, what are they called the big night they pee, call pee, it pee, big pee, night pee, pee. I, yeah i i grew up over off of uh, saddle hill road yeah and we had a whole bunch of like it was pretty much just you know houses plopped in the woods yeah it so we got to see wildlife all the time and i Love would go it. off and walk to the trail over by where uh, where duck pond is on the edge of the state park where no okay. one's ever nice. no one's ever there so it's really great to just walk that and you know, you can hear the frogs. You can see them like sitting on the side oh, of the water, I love that. and then you can make your way all the way over to Cedar Street if you want wow. from there too. Yeah, yeah. So that's a lot of fun. So I don't know if it's a hidden favorite, but I know uh, one of Mike's Rosen's favorites is um, Cornell's. Is it the cheeseburger pizza? <laughs> there? Cheeseburger pizza, Big Mac, is that? Cheeseburger pizza. <laughs> he says it tastes exactly like a Big Mac. Uh, I don't know. And they they got the special sauce in there. Yeah. Um, so Cornell's yeah. used to have that outdoor porch. Yeah. I've watched the evolution of it. Uh, no, I'm thinking of TJ's. Okay, yes. So, so yeah. TJ's is another spot. Yeah. Because they had, first they just had an outdoor porch. Yeah. And then they put a cover on the porch. And then they enclosed that area that was covered. Yeah. So a lot of people love to be out on that deck. Right. The bikes pull up there, motorcycles, yeah. you know, so people like to, I see people sitting out on the deck and this is a wonderful evening. Yeah. You know, having, enjoying food and beverage. Right. And we've got an email here so, uh, promoting the concerts on the common. Oh, yes. I was going to say I something mean, about that of actually. Course. Yeah. Because yeah. we have concerts on the common, movies on the common. Yeah. There's so much going There's the farmer's market. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. And isn't the, what's, who's doing the new thing? It's going to be like a, um, like a Hopkinton day. On yeah, it's September like 16th. Time. So it's that's I, you family know, I've been fun day. About that for years. I think yep. that's going to be so awesome. It's going to be great. And yeah, it, yeah, the friends of Hopkinton are the ones yeah, the that are setting it all up, and they uh, they want they saw how much people rallied around the uh, the 300th yeah. anniversary celebration, mm -hmm. and how much like community pride and spirit there was from right. it. Right. And it's now, you know, I think we're at the point now where it's a little bit retro, it's a little bit like old timey, you know, and it has an appeal well, to it. And the renovation of the fountain has, yes. I think, made the common a little even more retro and, um, right. you know, sort of traditional. I have to say Hot Acoustics is playing this Sunday at 5 okay. on uh, Sunday for the concerts on the common. So they do get some really great bands in there. They had the, the uh, high school symphony band. Yeah. Whatever, I think that's what it's called, was last weekend, I think, and they're, they were amazing, too. So they really get some great concerts in there. Right. And then they have the movie series. So kids can go and, and watch yeah. a movie on Thursday nights, I think. 
which is great to do during the summer because yeah. it's, it's those weekday nights that you run out of things for the kids to do usually because between parents working and stuff like that. Right. So, you know, bring them out to, like, you know, get a couple chairs, go sit on the common and watch mm. a movie. Right. That, or yeah. just go down to Sandy Beach and, yeah. um, and, you know, Sandy Beach is a beautiful place to hang out. Um, or in the evening, uh, the fireflies. Fireflies are amazing. Stars are amazing. Yeah. You know, there's so much around in the summer just being able to be outside. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice thing. Mm -hmm. And there's so many areas you can get to in town that are really great for stargazing because they're just out of the reach of, mm -hmm. like, light pollution. Uh, there's a couple that are, like, fields and such that are, you know, some of the ones on the outskirts of town. Yeah. Uh, I know there were a couple near where... I grew up that there were some soccer fields and stuff that weren't right, always like Green, used. Greenwood. Uh, yep, there, the one on Greenwood's a great Greenwood's one for great stargazing. One. Yeah, and there's huge sky over Legacy yeah. Farms. Yeah. Right. Because I right. know with the night that there was supposed to be the Aurora Borealis, yeah. I was driving up Clinton looking over there and I thought, oh my gosh, if I just plop my car here, I could see. And then the other thought I had was the um, Spine Road. Mm -hmm. Of legacy okay. north, yeah. Because up on top of that hill, there must be huge open sky because all the trees got cut down. Right. Somebody's giving a plug for a bingo Sunday afternoon. Oh, where's and that? Monday nights in Ashland. Oh, where is that? I don't in know. The, they uh, say, Mike, do you know where that is? That's Ash Ashland VFW. It's the Ashland Fire Department's oh. location. There you go. I wonder if that came from. See, how does Mike know about that? <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. All right. So, so we got just anybody else want to call in? Left. Tell no, us what they do that they love in the summer. Under a minute left. So well, maybe the they're going to be done. quick. But you know what? It'd be great if they uh, you know send an email or maybe even post it on our Facebook page. Um, yeah. You know, just plug in their favorite spots and what to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know. between the three of us, it sounds like nature carries the yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, at the same time, I also think that we have a lot of great places for both like ice cream and food. That's True. Like, yeah. well, that's very relaxed. True. Have you ever had? Um, Spoonery, uh, Liam's, Yogurt onion Beach. rings at Nosset Beach. I have no. Not. Oh. It's die for. We're gonna do a show coming up on your favorite ice cream spot. My favorite ice cream spot. Not, right. No, don't tell me now. <laughs> hey, it's gonna be spot. a future show. We're out of time. Oh no. Connor, thanks so much for sticking around. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate well, it. We're gonna have to have you back too. Anytime. So upcoming show is gonna be on your favorite ice cream spot. Maybe a little more about politics in the news and more local stuff. Thanks for watching. Thanks have for a great night, us. everybody. Jen will be back. <laughs>